Hey, everybody. Well, hey, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you guys are watching us from. I know we have a ton of people joining us from all across the country and also have a pretty good following across the world. I want to welcome you all to Note Night in America. Uh, it is the L.A. version. <laughs> uh, before I pull that up, actually, excited to be here. Uh, actually, I was short layover literally for roughly about 12 hours here in L.A. before we jump on an early flight out for vacation. But I wanted to make sure that uh, you guys did not miss out on too many Note Night in Americas. Um, we are headed for some long view R&R, &R, uh, some Hawaiian Island kind of things. We'll be dr drinking pog juice and sitting on a lapu lapu and a pineapple somewhere tomorrow at this time. But anyway, excited to be here with you guys tonight. We actually scheduled our flights in so I would arrive in time to be able to make sure and not miss a Note Night in America with you guys. So we're excited to be here. Uh, even though it's just a short term, it's probably gonna be right about an hour a long conference call uh, or coaching call or webinar, whatever you want to put it. But uh, want to thank you for joining us here. So let me go back here and share uh, my screen. Got some great stuff. If you do not have a pen and paper, grab one. If you want to take some notes to this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you, I'm going to put the slides up on SlideShare uh, tonight. So you guys can go back and review that. Uh, don't know if I'll get the video up tonight. Who knows how this hotel internet's going to work for me getting it up, uploaded to uh uh, we close on stock TV, but I'm gonna work to do that as well. So, uh, questions here, comments? Let's see here. Uh, hey, no problem. Eric. Glad to glad to help you guys out because I think this is a really valuable thing. Uh, but anyway, before we dive into the topic tonight, as always, we are no night in America. Uh, love doing these guys. It's one of our highlights of the week of being able to get out and communicate with so many note investors, so many students of ours across the world. All right. Um, as always, we have a five-year goal to help educate and create 10,000 note investors. I know I can't do that by taking too many note nights off. We have to do this on a regular basis. We're committed to do that and uh, just really excited our numbers. Uh, we're going to hit our first year targets out of that goal this year and hopefully get closer um, to year number two's goals as we dive into this. But more importantly, who is here on Note Night in America if it's your first time joining us? Uh, give me a shout out if you're watching this on Facebook. Do a hashtag first timer. All right. Hashtag first time, hashtag first timer. If you're watching this on Zoom, hey, make a chat. Hey, first time here. Glad to have you guys. But who is here? We have a variety of people that join us for Note Night in America. Obviously, real estate investors. That's what unites us all. We're all real estate investors of some sort, whether you've done thousands of deals or you're looking to get started. Obviously, note investors are a big uh, percentage of who we deal with. We're on these. Um, we have people that are looking to get into notes. Obviously, like, what the hell is this paper game? Um, what the hell is this first lien, second lien? What is all that stuff? And we'll go more into that. So um, if you have specific questions that are outside of the topics that we're going to talk about tonight, just save them to the end. And once we've gone through all the questions or the topic at hand, we'll cover those, okay? But if you ask questions that are oddball, I'm just going to delete it and just to stay on task and keep rocking and rolling, okay? Um, I have hit the record button. The red button's flashed at me. Besides live streaming these on Facebook, we do throw these up online. And so you can always catch a lot of the replays that we close on Stat TV. Um, and then also, guys, we're excited that Note Night in America has its own podcast. So we are recording this. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, awesome. Give me a shout out. Let me know. Drop an email at scottweeclosenotes.com because uh, every Note Night in America is now available on iTunes podcast for 2018. So I think this will be the 11th or 12th episode of the year. So. Pretty stoked about that, everybody. As always, um, hey, Steph, if you're watching, if you're watching, there's questions that pop up, feel free to interrupt me too, okay? All right, awesome, good stuff. Steph says hi. Uh, speaking of podcasts, the No Closure Show went over 94,000 downloads just recently. That's so awesome. We set a, uh, uh, we're on task to hit our $100,000, $100,000, 100,000 goal, 100,000 download mark by the first part of May, May 2nd, May 3rd, and it looks like we're going to end up doing that. So thank you for listening. Thank you for those that join it, watch it, leave reviews. Glad to have you guys there. But anyway, a uh, quick few minutes here on some of the upcoming events you want to be, um, have marked down. This week, uh, obviously in Vegas at the uh, Tuscany Casino, Bill McCarlo is going to have his uh, Paper Source Symposium taking place uh, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 26th to the 28th. Unfortunately, no, I'm not going to be there. I will be somewhere floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean probably at that time. So, sorry, no. I'll, I'll give you guys a shout-out for those at Paper Source. How's that sound? Okay? <laughs> but 
but you guys have a good time there. Bill Dogs puts on a pretty good event as well. So um, that, and then we have our fast track training in 11th to the 13th in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're excited about that for those that need some one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have May 17th to the 19th is the Laughlin Magnifier Well Summit. Uh, I forgot to put in here May 15th, actually, I'll be speaking in uh, Charlotte, uh, not Charlotte, sorry, Raleigh, Durham, at the uh, Triangle Real Estate Investment Group, the TRIA Group in Raleigh, Durham, uh, on that Tuesday night from 6.30 to 8.30, I believe. It's the time, so I need to put that on there, but excited for those that are out in North Carolina and in the Raleigh, Durham, Golden Triangle area, come out and see me Tuesday night. Um, now, our next virtual note buying workshop, and people asking that already, uh, is June 20th through the 22nd. Uh, that date may change, but that's the tentative date right now for the next virtual note buying workshop. If not, it'll get bumped to July. But then we have our next note mastermind, August 23rd and 24th. Yes, it's two days because it butts up next to the Quest Expo. So our next note mastermind group is a Thursday, Friday. And then we have fr Saturday and Sunday at the same hotel with the Quest Expo, 500 to 1,000 note investors. So, hey, if you guys want to come out and hang out, lots of good opportunity for you guys there going forward. So. Any questions about those upcoming events before we dive into the main topic at hand tonight? All right. Any questions online, Seth? I thought you were there. Uh, I will look here real fast. It's probably easier if I look. Dave Hauser just commented. Dave Hauser says, first note night, perfect timing for me. Was working on business plan today. Well, great, Dave. Glad to have you. I think he mentioned this to you as well, so we're glad to have you. So tonight's topic is all about building your business plan, okay? And I think I owe those of you that have been around uh, longer than a week or two weeks or longer than six months a bit of an apology. Um. We used to focus really heavily on building a business plan. And part of it was the fact that we did it when we had our, our eight week program with our note coaching students. We used to do eight weeks of webinars. The first week, first two weeks were always built around go diving into people's business plans and talking about writing. And when we stopped that and went to what we were doing, our fast track training in person for three days, we did away with this so we could maximize those three days. Uh, we'd still do some aspects of business plans in a mastermind groups like the SWOT analysis going through that. But I, as I was looking back and working the last few days on putting this PowerPoint together, you know, when it's the office Saturday, thinking a little about more what I wanted to include today, yesterday, I started thinking that I probably should have covered this a little bit more often um, because a business plan is one of the most important things that you can do um, at all for your entrepreneurial self. Okay, and I know a lot of people don't come from a business background. I mean, I was very lucky uh, my dad and mom are entrepreneurial mindset at a young age, grew up at working in the hardware store and um, doing a lot of stuff of my own as a young kid running different businesses. And then, of course, uh, as I, I, I joke here, Southwest Texas State would be proud because yes, I used to go to Southwest Texas. Uh, and that's a Texas State. I combined the two today. Together. Be proud. So I have a business degree. For those of you I don't know, I have a business management degree with a minor in marketing. In 2001, I'm sure the marketing side does not surprise you guys. Um, but the marketing that they teach in college is differently than what you do in real life these days, especially with it being 16, 17. Actually, yeah, going on 17 years since I graduated. First, of my family to graduate with a degree. Um, I got three fourths of the way through my MBA, Master's of Business Administration as well. Ooh, title, a comma, MBA, three fourths of the way through. But I left uh, Texas State. Um, to start Aero Capital Mortgage in 2005 uh, with my buddy Boyd Pops and then uh, my friend Ann Cox and then of course our friends Bob Lee and Eddie and Jimmy Kelly taught me a lot about it. But literally in that time frame, going through my undergrad, even in high school and then my undergrad and then all the projects we did and also when I was in an entrepreneurial basis, I have written and reviewed hundreds of different business plans. I would barely say probably close. I'm in the high three figures. I wouldn't say a thousand yet. I've written and reviewed hundreds of business plans, okay? And some of the big companies I reviewed for or even created for specific launches, and everything was Target, Mandalay Bay Casino. This goes back a ways. Uh, Verizon Wireless is responsible for writing some stuff up for their on their marketing stuff side here in, in Central Texas. 
uh, sells brewery. Of course, everybody's reviewed Disney stuff when they were in college and different things they did as well. What's so great about them as a, as a business is I've done a lot. And it's, it, I was looking back, I posted, I came across this photo just a few minutes ago and stuff's like cracking up at me. You know, this goes back to 2005, I believe in this photo here when I was out doing mortgages. Literally what's relevant about this, that picture was taken two weeks after July, July 18th, back in 2005, I believe. So actually just across the street here at the uh, the Marriott. I was there for a big Ron LeGrand seminar doing mortgages and had a, we had a business plan. Actually Boyd had an MBA from University of Texas and we kind of worked out a business plan. What we need to focus on, how do we need to do some things? And we leveraged some of the great things we had with Ann and some of our other relationships we made to really be, run a very successful mortgage company until everything hit the fan a few years later, okay? So, uh, yeah, that, that picture there cracks me up there. I got a, Steph says I had a lot more hair and looked a little bit younger. And the note business will take your hair away from me, I guess. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, when he says you had hair, I had a little longer hair there, yes. I'm a little shaved here. It's a little thinner at the top here, which is fine. But the, the thing I don't want, the thing I, I, I have dealt with for a long time in the last 14 years is I'd still look very young, okay? And then that picture, I look extremely young compared to what I look like now. But if you can imagine that young kid being about three, a couple years removed from that photo of actually going and talking with bank asset managers and building a plan and having the Weibos to start sell everything he had in Austin and travel across the country for three years nonstop, you might understand why I have a little bit less hair. Okay, and a little bit more barbacoa on my face, you should say. But anyway, we all start somewhere. And I know a lot of people don't have any type of business background. And that's why when I was going through this, I was like, man, I should probably talk about this a little bit more on. I should talk more about this. And it's probably going to be a bit of a, uh, a thing that we focus a little bit more on the Note Closer Show podcast as well over the next few weeks. But if you don't have any, and if you don't have a business plan, I, I see why so many real estate investors, real estate entrepreneurs, struggles they don't really have a plan okay they don't really have a plan of action and as i like to say if you're failing to plan that's really planning to fail if you aren't putting some sort of guide in place what you want to focus on um assets class you're going to find yourself struggling you're going to find yourself trying to square uh, trying to put square pegs in round holes you're going to find trying to grasp onto any type of deal from anybody and it's going to be a failure for you when you should learn to just to stick to what your plan of action is and be a lot better off. And I think I take this for granted that I plan a lot of stuff out. I am constantly working at numbers. I know my numbers and I know my people up here on webinars and our marketing. And I know my KPIs down to a T. How many people do I need to get a workshop? How many deals do I need to close to hit 100K in profit and vice versa? Okay. So if anything, if you get anything for tonight, and you're brand new to this, take some time, go back and watch this webinar over again, because I'm going to probably go through it kind of fast because I'm, I'm a little tired, a little jet lagged. Um, but I really knew this, this coaching call, this webinar is going to be very important for you. So business plans, plan your action, okay? That's the thing. They plan your action. They help guide you. They help you stay focused. They help you avoid drifting. If you're struggling with drifting, you're struggling with, struggling with success, it's probably because you really don't have a plan of action. You don't, and that's not necessarily a fault of your own. You may have never taught this, or you just bombarded with so many things, coming in, so many shiny objects and squirrels hitting you in the face from the local RIAs and the meetups, the webinars, the coach calls. You're just confused as shit. All right? You're just like, what would I turn? What, what, what do I focus on? And that's normal. Okay? I was once there, too, to like, let me go ahead and plan this out and go from there. Okay? Uh, this definitely, your business plan will give you a guide when you don't have a clue, <laughs> okay? What do I need to focus on when I, and I'm like, what am I doing? What do I need to be doing? Or like, I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs. What do I need to be focused on, okay? Uh, it starts, always starts, basic thing that you start with, and this is what they teach you in business school. It always, always starts with a SWOT. Now, what's a SWOT? Now, that's not, it's not Samuel L. Jackson busting in the front door with his, you know, SWAT team, okay, with Colin Farrell and Ella Cool J, Michelle Rodriguez, okay? It's not a SWAT. That's not what SWAT stands for, not strategic weapons and tactical. What SWAT in our business world stands for is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, okay? That's what a SWOT analysis starts with, okay? It helps you create a plan. 
because you it helps allows you to literally it's like best of Oprah for those that don't know business it's like Oprah or Dr. Phil what is Oprah and Dr. Phil talk about all the time pros and cons okay strengths weaknesses what are some opportunities that you guys have that you have individually or what are some threats that you have put those on paper help you outline kind of the, the way that you want to roll okay so that's important because they all kind of tie in together to help you really identify your opportunities and really where you want to go down the long term. Okay. All right. Questions about that before we dive into the different types of business plans. Okay. Now, a good thing too that you might want to do besides just doing a SWAT might be to do a, a Myers-Briggs exam or a DISC test. All right. That might be a good thing to do with you in your um, team or your spouse or people that you're partners with. Some people like the traction aspect of things. I think traction is great, but if it's you, if you're a one man show or you're just literally at three people, traction will confuse you more than it will help you, I believe. When if you could just spend time on a good business plan, it'll give you more guidance than anything else, okay? So there's basically two types of business plans. You have a traditional business plan, okay? Um, then you also have a lean startup plan. Now that they're two very different. Okay, two types of business plans. Most of you are going to be very familiar with the traditional business plan. This is, a, you know, have, it's got like nine parts. You got executive summary, company description, market analysis, organizational management roles, uh, service or product line that you're in, marketing and sales, funding requests, uh, any financial projections, and then you always has an appendix. And this is where this can take, it's timely, okay? Then you have the lean startup plan, which is really easy to throw in place. And I think it's not really good if you're going to be writing a business plan for your business model. I don't think a lean startup plan is is the right thing to do. I think it's – I'd like to call it something later else. But in the lean startup plan, you focus on – it's really short, really easy to put together. You focus on your key partnerships, your key activities, your key resources. All right. You have a value, value proposition that you're trying to offer up. Okay. Um, you focus on customer relationships, customer segments. Okay your business channels, and your cross structures, okay? And that obviously dies in your revenue streams. I like to say the Lean Startup Plan is your business plan 2.0. I don't, I don't think you can write a Lean Startup Plan to begin with until you know what's going into traditional in Plan A. Does that make sense, everybody? So a traditional marketing plan, okay? Like I say, it's longer to write. And sometimes the more time you spend on it, great, but it also you don't want to be suffering from overanalyst paralysis. Okay, you don't want to take forever on it and never get out of the planning stage into the action stage. Okay, um, the nine sections. A lot of people are like, oh my god, do I have to go in order? I don't know what this means. That's okay. All right, start just start filling out sections. If you know what one section is and you're comfortable with that one section, dive into that section. Come back to the hardest later on. Okay, but start with the easiest. Okay, and then fill in the rest. All right. You want this to be detailed and comprehensive, and there's going to be some blending and run over in the different types of segments that you have. The sections, different sections will have a little bit, will sound a little repetitiveness, or be a little repetitive as you kind of flow through your plan or as you edit through things, okay? Um, it is a favorite of lenders and investors, if you're great in the true business world. A traditional marketing plan basically is the whole thing, A to Z, okay? And it really gives lenders and investors an opportunity to really look at um, the whole picture, the whole enchilada, okay? Um, like I said, it gives you the clearest picture and the clearest focus of ultimately where you really want to go. Now, a lean startup plan, it's higher level focus, okay? And this is why I call it business plan 2.0. It's fast to write, all right? It contains the key elements only. It's often only one page, okay? It might be two pages. But often it's like a summary. Hey, here's an idea, and we're going to run with it, okay? Um, it's, it's just an idea to kind of get people interested in the course. A lot of times lenders and investors will come back and ask for more information about your deal that you take back in, and you're forecasting, and you look at your sales projections and stuff like that. So while the Lean Startup Plan is great, if I was in business for five years and I was adding on something new, or adding on a product, or adding on a different market, I would do a startup plan for that market. Okay, um, and we'll give a little bit more of that in a, in a minute here. Okay, as I said before, it's like business plan number two. You should always do the first one, a traditional business plan first. You'll learn more about yourself and more about really where you're focused and what you're not focused on by diving deep 
and bean specific things. So let's get into that. All right, let's get into your traditional marketing plan. Anybody have any questions before we dive into any of this stuff beforehand? Okay. Just looking here, so we got any other questions online or not? Looks like we're good. Okay. So let's dive into this part first. An executive summary is the first thing that you have to create. All right. This is going to be your kind of your compass that guides you on things. Okay. Um, and yes, Mark asks the question. Mark has to ask questions. There's a difference between a business plan and a marketing plan. Big difference, Mark. You can't have a marketing plan without a business plan, but you can have a business plan without a marketing plan. Okay. A marketing plan is often in sight of a business plan. Okay. All right. But yes, you've got to have a business plan to really identify what that is that you're marketing. Does that make sense? So I'll get to it later on. Okay. So uh, your traditional business, I don't know why I said marketing plan. It should be business plan, but uh, that's what happens when you run away. Okay. Your executive summary is basically it's a short, it's a one page thing. And sometimes it's written last. You start off writing an executive summary, really what you focus on. And after, as you dive into your business plan and your marketing plan and stuff like that inside your business plan, it's common to come back and rewrite your executive summary. Because the last thing you want to do is write an executive summary, say things, and then your business plan shows something else and it's more confusing. So some, I always say, don't be too hard yourself. Start with your executive summary, where you want to focus on. Dive into your business plan elements and don't be afraid if you end up going back and changing. A lot of people in the northern street are having to change their business models right now because they're second lien investors. Okay. So they can't find any seconds that make any sense. So they're going to change and go back to the first lien right or learn that a little bit more. So change their marketing, change their fundraising. Okay. Your traditional executive summary is one page, one page long, two to three paragraphs. You want to make it at a fifth grade reading level. Okay. You don't want to be using words and terms that go over anybody's heads. That makes you look it, it actually is stupid on your part to do that. You want the executive summary where everybody can see it and read it and understand what you're doing. If you're using terminology and, and a lot of jargon in your executive summary, you better hope only the people that are in your field read it, okay? Me, I use my executive summary when we travel a lot. It's one of the things that, hey, it's, it's basically the, the what about you aspect of things, okay? Talks about your company, your focus, and then you, your short bio. Now, what's funny What's funny is there's people on here who have a website. And I've seen a lot of your websites, okay? And some of your websites are great, and some of your websites stink. Um, for those of you that have, like, where it shows up like it's a one-person website, hi, I'm the person that you talk to everything. I'm the jack of all trades. That's not really a good thing to show, okay? Yeah, I get it. Maybe it's trying to be comical, but if it, does, it doesn't come across professional. It actually hurts you more than anything. Also, if you don't have a bio on your website, like the about you, where it's, there's no pictures of your faces, there's no people involved, it's just a logo, and eh, people want to identify with a person. They want to know about your bio. What's your background? What's your past? What's your, you know, what are the things you enjoy doing? That adds up a personal touch to what you're doing, okay? So always include, it doesn't be a long, we don't want to be a long bio, but make it a short three to four paragraph executive summary. A little about your company, what you're focused on, and then if you, you know if it's about you, great. All right, hey, it's what I do. I've been doing this for years. I got a background in this. I like long walks on the beach and drinking pineapples juice, okay, in Malibu, or whatever. I like a good, uh, good Crown Royal and Sprite with a good Cuban cigar. I don't know. Just make it a little bit about yourself. It's okay to be personal. It doesn't always be so serious, but you also, hey, you want to include that. There's people that spoke at no camp that don't have a bio on their website kind of scary or what they have on their website shows for a different company or different entity that doesn't even reflect the entity that they're trying to target to especially those that are working full-time you're still working a full-time job you want your business plan to be about your company where you're going not the company you're working at for the job okay so here's what a sample executive is actually not an up-to-date one but uh that's what i pulled off my desktop where i usually get printed up but you can see uh, train problem properties and problem solution, verse investments, Texas based real estate firm on the education side. We no buying for dummies. Scott Garst, the president of Inverse investments. This guy's a national speaker. Something short and sweet. 
Okay, our strategy is to purchase mortgage debt at a fraction of that. Now, what I also use with my one page flyer is I put pictures on the back of it. Okay, I want people when they see their executive summary to realize it, hey, I'm just on a one man show. I'm a part of a network of investors across the country. So, on this example, I put a picture of a mastermind in Miami, a picture of a mastermind in San Diego. Okay. You know, if you have a part of a real estate group, part of a meetup group, or a specific note closure or something like that, post that in there. Post it in the back of it. Post a picture of your vendors. It adds strength to the executive summary. It's okay to pay for two printed pages from FedEx. It adds an extra value, okay? But that's what roughly my executive summary looks like, okay? Now, beyond your executive summary, I would then just probably, if I were all of you guys starting off, brand new, I would just go ahead and fill out the easy sections. Get those done, check them off, so you feel a little bit better about your business plan. Last thing you wanna do is try to go in order and bang your head against a session and then never get to the rest of this, the other sections when you could go and get probably half your business plan filled out by filling out the easy sections. So by the easy sections, I mean the company description. And by company description, let's keep it simple, silly. Okay, make it an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLP. Uh, don't be doing NB or do, uh, I'm doing a DBA. Only do a DBA if you have a parent LLC. Okay. Or, and then don't put trusts in there. I know a lot of people like to use trust for asset protection, but honestly, it's just use an LLC. Okay. Pay me the, the 30 bucks if you're in Mississippi or the 800 bucks a year if you're in California to register it. It's just a cost of doing business and just get over yourself and do it. Okay. If you're going to bitch about $800. For registration fees every year, you probably should not be in business then. Okay, not in the note business anyway. Okay, and then the next part is your organization and management. You know, kind of the structure. Here's who's up here, who's in charge of this, and who does what. Okay, now it may be you doing everything. Okay, uh, or your partners or your family members. Now, the one thing about family members I'm not a fan of is if your families aren't, if your family members aren't pulling their weight, it takes away. From your business plan. Oh, I'm going to have my son. I'm going to have my daughter work in the business. Well, that's great as long as they're working. If they're not working <coughs> and they move back in with mom or dad or they're doing something else and their uh, LinkedIn profile doesn't even say anything about your business, don't put them down. It just takes away. All right. If you have business partners, okay, great. Put them down. Are people that you uh, work with or bounce ideas off? It's okay. Put them down. Okay. Uh, I would highly make a section about your vendors, okay? Talk about your vendors, especially in the note business where everybody sometimes thinks that we do everything. Your organization and management, especially the management level, say, hey, here's the vendors that we use to, and, and write a brief description about each one. That's a little bit different about the note business than with your traditional, you know, tiddlyweeks business, okay? Now, let's talk about your service and product line, okay? This is really the biggest nuts and bolts. And yes, I have a picture of tiddlywinks in there because that's one of the biggest things that we'd always used to talk about. Ooh, we've, what are you selling tiddlywinks, okay? Or whatchamacallits, okay? So Gail asks a good question. I'm, I'm glad he asked this, Gail. So if I'm a, uh, if I'm a one woman show, how do I reflect that in my org and management section and still sound professional? So what I would do is say, hey, you're the management on the side and then you have your server scene Make the organizational start where it's basically, okay, your servicing is handled by Madison Management. Your foreclosure is the senior law group or your attorneys in the specific states that you're working in, okay? That's what I would do. That's, that's, that's a very common question, but that's why I say, oh, let's say you look at the one-man show, say you're the, it, almost like that. Um, let me give you a great example. Um, in a traditional real estate transaction, what's the main spoke? What's in the middle of a traditional real estate transaction? Think about it. It's a title company, right? Because title company is collecting information from uh, their uh, their plant, and they're also dealing with the loan officers, and then the mortgage brokers, and then the real estate agents. Okay, they're the hub. Everything comes in and goes out. So make your chart like, hey, I'm in present. I'm here, and I handle all this stuff. So if you have social, serving social being your social media, put them down. If you have people um, that working with you or Partnering up or accountability partners, put them in there. Does that make sense, Gail? Yes, focus on your partners. That way, because you got, that's the biggest thing. This is a little bit different than your tiddlywinks business plan, okay? 
So, like, going back to the point before Gail asked the question, but that was a good question. I'm not mad. You have to realize, what are you in the business, okay? What are you in the business of buying or in the business of? Are you in first liens, second liens, REOs, performing, not performing, owner finance notes? There's a lot with what we do, right, everybody? And sometimes you're doing two or more things. Yes, I want to buy first liens. Well, if you're buying first liens, you know what that leads to? Well, that's non-performing notes. It eventually leads to either REOs or performing notes. So you're really in the business of three. You've got three kind of categories. You're going to be selling or uh, selling or performing notes for a while, maybe, or the sale of REOs. So you've got to keep that in mind. Phase one, you're buying non-performing. I get that. But you also got to keep in mind that um, A2 and A3 are auxiliary businesses of what you do. So it's okay to share that. <clears throat> the reason... Um, I, Jeff Wolf, I was, sorry, I'll be doing that forever now. Is Jeff on here tonight? He doesn't have to take this type of abuse. I know. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is Jeff was talking about how he meets people at the uh, local RIA club in San Diego. And then he's at like 11 extra strategies. And I'm like, Oh, that's too much. Okay. Keep it simple to like three strategies. Yes. We all know it can happen a variety of ways. We have multiple extra strategy notes. But just keep it narrowed down to like the main three, reperforming, foreclosure, DLO, and then the REO sales. That's basically what's going to end up happening, okay? There it is. You're welcome, buddy. I, you know, it's good that you know your 11 exit strategy because that's important when you get into your forecasting and your financial model, which we'll get to later on. But initially, if you're out raising capital, you want to try to keep it simple, okay? Now, back to, we're getting out here. Knowing what you're at, knowing where you're buying at, the states, the cities, you don't necessarily want to say I'm buying off of these states because you're not. And I can always tell the people who aren't buying anything they ask for, are they licensed in all 50 states? Well, <laughs> that's like the first giveaway that you probably aren't buying anything. I don't want to work with somebody who's licensed in all 50 states. Now, you want to work with somebody who's licensed in the states you're doing business in. And that's all that matters. Okay, if you're just buying in Texas or just buying in California or just buying in Illinois, you have a much easier business plan to write, much easier forecasting model. Because you're focused on the one target identity. And that also limits you if your focus is so small and then you don't have the deal flow. Okay. The asset class is important. Like right now, if I'm staying in LA, I'm not going to go out and track down $100,000 houses, non performing notes of $100,000 houses. And that's not going to make sense. But that would make sense in Cleveland. It would make sense in Columbus. Okay. That would make sense here. Oh, I'm targeting the million plus property. Great. Would not necessarily make sense in Columbus. Okay. Uh, the price points, what are you buying at? If you keep that in mind. Uh, the, the price points make sense. Somebody called me today, I was trying to buy a non-performing bankruptcy chapter 13 loan that was in foreclosure. That's 70 cents a dollar. I'm like, what? In Alabama, of all places. I'm like, no. Tell that person to go, smoke, to go pound sand. They're smoking way too much crack. Trying to sell a non-performing BK 13 loan. This person's failed on it. It's a non-performing loan in Alabama. You should not be paying 70 cents of a dollar. Okay. Knowing what you're in the business in and what you're really, what your tiddlywink business model is, that takes us next to your financial projections. And this is often the hardest thing for some people. And the beautiful thing is, if you've been around for a while, I think I've broken this down for you in a couple different ways. Okay. So first thing you gotta do is look at how are you looking to, how much are you looking to make in the next 12, 24, 36 months? Same thing. How many deals are you looking to close the first 12, 24, 36 months? Okay. It should not be flat. It should not be the same number every month, every year. We know that's not going to happen. If you're in a flat, you really, nobody's going to believe that business model. You're going to start off slow and you're going to work up. If you're a brand new note investor in the first 12 months, you could do 20, 30 notes. I'm saying you can't do more. It's just more likely going to happen year two. All right. I think a good 12 month goal is 30 deals. All right. That's about two and a half deals a month. It's very feasible. And looking to get to 50 in your second year. So that's so you've done total 80 deals. And then maybe your third year is you go to the third three figures, 100. Okay. But your program, your model is not going to be flat. If you're flat, you're really probably not focused on it full time. Now, if you're just doing this part time, that's okay to be flat that you, hey, I'm still working 40 hours a week. I only have 10 hours a week. I'm focusing on just closing one or two deals a month period. I love what I do. And I'm going to be the first one to tell you that's great. High five. You're fine. Okay. 
But if your goal is to do this full time, you need to have those numbers be a little bit more aggressive, do things a little bigger. Now, you can always go back and adjust your numbers, okay? But I would, I would do is I set your numbers a little bit outside of what you're focused on. Instead of saying, I'll give you an example. If I, we have somebody who wants, oh, I'm going to do one video a month. Well, you can do more than one video a month. Do two, do three, stretch yourself. You're already doing one video a month. You're not really stretching yourself by writing a business plan to get to where you want to be. Okay? Because you keep in mind, this is a business plan for where you want to be in the next 12, 24, 36 months. Not a business plan where I'm at today. There's a big difference there. You got to kind of think outside the numbers. If you're building a business plan for where you're at today, you're wasting time. You're not really stretching yourself and, and helping you. A business plan is to help you build a business model of moving into the future 36 to 60 months, not staying dormant, okay? Um, one of the great things that we've done, one of the number one videos that we've ever did was the 250K in 12 months plan. It's a great start to look at. If you haven't seen that, you can go to weclosednotes.tv and check that out. Um, I think if you type in 250K in 2016 or 2017 or 2018, it'll pull up in Google. It's one of the, I think our, one of our most downloaded videos. But it gives you a business plan of, okay, if you need to make 100K in the first year, here's how it kind of breaks down. Okay. But that's a good guide to go off. Now, the thing to keep in mind with your business model, and I bring this back to the previous slide of, of the three main strategies you're probably gonna be into is because you're gonna have a variety of, it's not gonna all be reperforming loans. Now, while one of those plans, the 250K in 12 months is a good start, it's just a start, okay? Uh, oh, big, big point, if you're working, hey, make a plan to replace your income in 12 to 24 months. Make that a simple thing. So that in the 24 months, you've gotta make 150 grand a year. And shoot to be halfway in the first year, okay? Or a third of that way so that your 50K is the end of the first year, making it part-time, and then maybe you make 100K the second year, okay? Now, I don't start with marketing and sales because your marketing plan inside your business plan or your sales plan, you have to know your numbers. You got to know your financial projections, roughly where you want to be first to go back in and build your numbers and help re reverse engineer your marketing and sales plans. Okay, so uh, your marketing sales plan is how you get to your financial goals. What, how much are you making per deal? Okay, what are you making per sale? Okay, or per lead or per note deal? Okay, um, numbers to keep in mind is that you've got a 10% closing ratio on offers made. So if you make 60 offers, you're probably only going to get six approved. And if those six approved out of those three, you get three performing, and three of those you take back as foreclosures. So if you got three of those. You're reperforming at five hundred dollars a month. You got fifteen hundred a month residual. Well, then if you're making five grand or ten grand per the foreclosure or deed lieu, that's thirty grand or fifteen grand, depending on those numbers work out for you. Okay, so that's why I say figure out your number 50-50 split, performing, and then some sort of REO deed lieu on the back end. Okay, take your notes. Depending on the markets you're in, you're going to see a reperforming out somewhere between three hundred and six hundred dollars per month. Okay. Uh, and then depending on the market and what you're paying, you're going to see at least, I would hopefully you're not making any offers where you're not making at least five grand or 10 grand per foreclosure deed loan to your side. Now, you're using other people's money, you should be making twice that amount, at least 10 to 20 grand, if not 30 grand to cover on your JV partner's money, okay? Now, once you've got your sales numbers, then you figure your marketing plan, okay? Here's how much I need to close. How many offers do I need to make? Well, how many emails do I need to send out? How many banks do I need to call? Okay. This is where you figure out, okay, my marketing plan, I'm going to be sending out uh, one email every Sunday night. I'm doing one video every Friday. Okay. That's the Cody Cox marketing plan right there. All right. Email Sunday night, and then it's Friday stroll on Friday. Okay. How many posts a month are you doing or a week are you doing on social media? That's the whole 30-30 plan. Okay. What conferences, what events are you going to? What meetup groups are you going to? You need to literally write that in your plan and figure out what it costs to go to this thing. Start budgeting that stuff in so you can see what your budgeting numbers are for what it's going to cost you on an annual basis, okay? Figure out how many banks or hedge funds or private sellers you're going to be dealing with on a regular basis. Now, that's the hardest number to figure out. But you try to need to put that in your marketing plan that I'm going to email out to asset managers at least 50 a week, okay? 
Now you can make 50 phone calls in a day. What I get really frustrated is when, when somebody calls and tells me, well, I've made 10 phone calls. I'm like, you haven't called banks. Don't tell me that. Okay. If you send an email to your database yet, no, then shut up then. Maybe until you've done it for four weeks or five weeks straight, then get back to me. Don't send it out once and then come crying to me. Oh, it didn't work. You haven't done it long enough. You, you, it's like planting a seed and then turn around and saying, where's my pumpkin? I don't, I don't have anything to grow here. You, know, you got to give it time to build. This is a marketing plan. It's not an instantaneous get wealth plan. Okay. Uh, and then also your marketing plan will also help you identify if you work the numbers right. And based on how many deals you're closing, your price points, they will tell you how much in private capital you need to raise. Okay. And then you want to take that number and build that into your funding request, which is one of the last slides we'll get to. Okay. So this making sense, everybody? Questions, comments, concerns before we move on to the next slide. Thank you for liking it. If you guys are watching this, that's awesome. Glad that you are liking, liking this. Yahoo. Okay, thumbs up, thumbs up. Thanks, okay. Good stuff. Hi, Casey. Hi, Frank. Hi, Cody. Hi, Karina. Okay, good stuff. People are watching here, which is great. All right. So, whoops, we had a question here. Makes total sense. Thanks, yeah. All right. So now an important part besides your marketing is your market analysis. This is a little bit different. Okay. And what I mean by this is you need to know what your market entails. Okay. This is not marketing. Your market analysis is by a, it's like Philip is, if I was going to start selling tiddlywinks, I want to make sure there's a market for tiddlywinks. I'm not going to create, and this is the biggest problem I see with entrepreneurs is they have this great idea, but there's the great idea is such a niche market or such a small market. Okay. It doesn't make any sense. And I see this happen too. With a lot of real estate entrepreneurs, oh, I'm going to be a fix and flipper in Austin, Texas. I'm like, well, guess what? That's not a good market to be a uh, fix and flipper in. You need to focus on what's the market going to bring to you. So with us being no investors, we have a bigger piece of the pie when it comes to the market because we have multiple states. So that's what you got to figure out. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> Sorry. All right. Where are you buying your tiddlywinks at? <laughs> okay. Or your tiddly notes? Yeah, your piddly notes. We should do that. Piddly notes. All right. The game for every note real estate operator out there. Okay. Um, like I said before, focus on three to five states. Okay. Focus on the largest cities. Um, there was an article that came out was it today or yesterday. You yesterday, I don't know. I was reading it sometime on a plane, I think. Talking about Indianapolis is actually decreasing in value. We... Median income actually decreased in Indianapolis, which made it as not desirable city as it used to be. There's something important to think about, which I think Indianapolis, Indiana is a great state, but depending on the economic conditions, it may differ. That's why it's important to be checking your market analysis. Years ago, a lot of people were like, oh, no, Florida's horrible. I'm not going to buy in Florida. And me, I'm like, no, the market analysis sense makes good sense. I'm going to buy in Florida. Where I was one of the few people buying in Florida, making a lot of money in Florida, when other people are like, oh, no, it's too long a foreclosure time frame. And I was getting a lot of stuff done before that. Okay. So look at your, your states, look at your cities, the, the percentage of foreclosures. Is there a lot? So I, I'll give you an example Bear County, which is San Antonio, had less than like 90 foreclosures last month. That's not a good thing. All right. It is a good thing because it has a fast foreclosure time frame, but it, it, there's, no, there's no supply there. Okay. So it's overpriced. So what you need to do is try to find, like I say, a couple markets, a couple states. Is a decent foreclosure percentage. There's still decent non-performing note market and not too long a foreclosure time frame. I wouldn't go past 12 months. I still would avoid New Jersey unless your goal in New Jersey is to foreclose and rehab the property and sell it. I think that makes sense. Does not make sense if you're in New Jersey trying to buy that to reperform. Just doesn't make sense because of the foreclosure time frames will kill you and your ROIs. Okay. You want to look at your average days in the market too inside of your cities and states you know if you are buying in an area and it's got a 300 day time on the market that's not a good market to begin with we had somebody call me up was going to buy a note in lagrange texas uh which is about an hour plus east of austin where zz top is from right ninety thousand dollar property um he's picking up for 30 grand 
I uh, need about 30 grand work. I was like, oh, so you're into it at 66 cents on the dollar right now. Yeah. I said, well, what are you using? Your own money? Oh, no, I got a hard money lender who's going to lend me money. I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, it's kind of expensive money at 15 plus three. I said, what's the days on the market? He goes, 385 days. I said, so for you to get this property, take it back and fix it up and then sell it, is it going to take over a year? Have you figured out what your money costs are going to cost you and how that's going to eat into your profits? He's like, no, I've not done that yet. When we ran the numbers, he realized he would end up owing the hard money lender money and I'll be in a good spot, Okay. Mike asked a good question here. Where do you find this number? The average days of market, you pick up the phone and call your realtors. You go to Yahoo Real Estate or Google Real Estate, or you, um, you, you do a research on the markets you're in. And I'm, I use a variety of things. I'm, I'm constantly reading articles on the real estate in the cities that we invest in, in the states. This is one of the things I do on a regular basis by just being an avid reader of different markets and foreclosure timeframes and debt ratios and things like that. Okay. Question here. Sorry, Lyle. Is ZZ Top? I think it's from LaGrange, though. I don't think it's from Galveston. They may have played at Galveston a lot, but I think ZZ Top is from LaGrange. I may be wrong, but anyway, whatever. They're a Texas town. Okay. Uh, you owe your market value. We talked a little bit about this earlier, too. Are you going to be playing the low? You know, sub 675,000, the middle 75 to 150 or the 150 and above, or the 250 and above, what price range and market values are you gonna be playing? Like I've got buddies in Houston that do it all across the board. I got our, our buddy, uh, Jason Bible, buys a lot in the middle sized things, okay? Our uh, buddy, oh my God, Ginger Boy. Bald, who's our buddy in Houston? I, I just, I'm drawing a blank. Curtis, Curtis, Curtis oh, Jesus Christ, Curtis Warden. Sorry, Curtis, I need a nap, okay? Curtis Warden, he likes the higher end stuff. Okay, AC Ramos likes the mid to lower range stuff. You have to know what your market's going to yield and whether the number is going to fix on that aspect of that. Curse is watching it. He's going to kick me next time, which is fine. So Zip asks, how do you describe the JV options for the business plan? I'll get to that, Zip. Just hang on here, buddy. We're not there yet. Okay, we're talking market analysis still stuff. Okay. All right, then you need to look at, too, part of your market analysis, there are a lot of banks lending there. Okay. It might be using Distress Pro, like with from Brett Palumbo, or, or Note Pros to target for those deals. Or am I going to go after servicing companies? Am I going to go to Lane Guide? Am I going to go after other lists to find this stuff? Those are things in your market analysis you consider. The stronger your market analysis, the more like more confident you're going to feel when you're not talking to investors about the deals you're doing. Okay? Of course, your market analysis and your marketing are going to have to cross over about how you position yourself and what you do to target your focus how do you market to those people to take advantage of that? Okay. This gets to the next point. And we're all about the funding requests. Okay. Now, this is where Zip. <laughs> Pay attention, buddy. And we'll get to it. I think the best thing you can do in your business plan is just have a bunch of case studies. And not, don't be like some of these jackasses out there that say, oh, here's one free case study. What is that, the one note you've closed in the last 12 months? I think if you got one case study to share, you're, you're, you're stupid. You're probably not doing the right thing. There are the, thing, the reason I'm telling you, there are plenty of people closing a lot of deals out there. Okay? So, I mean, literally, if you look at one of the last episodes we did the Note Closer Show podcast, we talked about 12 or 20 deals that we've closed on in the last few months. The thing I want to get at is the case studies don't always have to be something that you have closed. You can use these, use the simple thing. These are the types of deals that we do. These are the types of deals that we do. And if you leverage it with the fact that I'm a part of a group or part of a investment club or part of a mastermind group, okay? These are the people that I work with. Hence the photo that I shared on like our uh, executive summary. That gives you more value. It makes you look smarter than you are. Because you're in a group mentality. You've got plenty of people to look over things for you. Okay? I'm not saying you're stupid. We just all lack experience, right? <clears throat> okay? Case studies, sample deals. Hell, you can pull a deal off of Watermark Exchange or FCI Exchange or uh, Loan MLS or um, Paperstack.com, okay? And break down the numbers, okay? Now, what I would do also, which might you might come across more individual, the reason I'm getting at the point here, this is portfolio offered 100k or more, <clears throat> especially Zip said, how do you get into talking JV deals? 
Look, talk about bigger deals. People ask, well, oh, what are you looking for? Well, I always say, we, you know, I, I like to take down multiple deals. I don't want to do one-offs. I get a better pricing if I do a bulk offering, okay? A bulk offering could be four assets. It could be two assets if we've never done one, okay? What I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Start people off. If you, the more you're completing your business plan, here's what we do. Here's what we focused on. Great. You get in where you're closing deals on a regular basis that are 100 grand or more, where you're taking multiple investors and they want to fund case studies, fund some of your sample deals. What, what happens? I should put this in here. You got sample deals. And then what you do here are the deals that we have available right now. Here's deal one, deal two, deal three, deal four, deal five, deal six, okay, that we've got available right now. And that's how you talk that out. Well, I got a JV partner who's got 50 grand. I can't fund all 100 grand, but I can buy, I could probably fund two of these deals for at 50 or 60 grand. Great, let's get you rock and rolling, okay? Now, you always want to talk long-term goals. My long-term goals is, is actually short-term in our note business, but the reason I say long-term, it's long-term for most people who are thinking paycheck to paycheck, okay? You want to talk long-term goals. Anyway, I'm still, we're doing this now. In three years, we expect to have our own fund. And what I'm trying to get at is you want to paint a bigger picture because people love being a part of a story. They love being a part of a bigger picture. And I've been around for 10 years, and I can tell you how many people come up to me, oh, I, I knew you back when you had a lot more hair. <laughs> when you were a third of the man, or a third smaller of the guy that you are now, okay? But that's good. You want to plant your long-term goals. Talk about it. Hey, we're buying in three markets now. We expect to add to five markets. We want to close on 20 deals this year. We expect to be at 60 deals by year three, okay? You want people like, oh, that's great. I want to be a part of something. Because what happens is most people – don't have the labels to do it. So zip, as you're out talking to your partners, here's the type of deals that we do. Here's some of the case studies of some of the deals that we've closed or some of my friends and I have closed together, some friends that closed recently. Talk about that, okay? Don't be afraid to ask for more. And if you've ever been through the virtual workshop and you've really never downloaded the 200 page manual, you will see inside of the manual, there's a 17 page marketing plan for a portfolio of 17 Florida notes. It's $185,000 funding amount. And the people came to me that I wrote that up for, I knew they had a million, but I knew they wanted to start off something around 250. That's fine. Well, in the, in literally in the marketing plan of that deal, it says 185. And then I also say, oh, hey, I would use the 65 grand to find and fund individual one-off deals along the way. to boost. And at the very end, the last paragraph says, this is what we do with 250. But then the last paragraph said, well, if we, we were to receive an injection of a million dollars, playing that scene for bigger things, you would see us doing a bigger pool or doing two or three more pools exactly like we talked about before. Okay. So what about the splits? Well, Zip, I don't get into the splits on a business plan. This is why it's important to talk with your investor. Okay. What have they done before? This is the whole interviewing phase. If we, you remember us going, if you went through the virtual workshop, if you've been to a virtual workshop or seen, talk anything, it's all about interviewing your, your investors. What are they looking for? You don't want to promise 12% if they think that they'd be having any 4%. You also want to promise only 4% if they're more aggressive and want to make 50% of the deal, okay? You have to literally talk with investors. And one of the easiest ways to do is, is the form method, okay? Where are you from? What do you do? Okay, what do you do for fun this weekend? R, recreation, and then your message. That's a short little thing, okay? What do you do for message? And then they ask you what you do, and you talk about real estate investing. Why buy and sell distressed debts? Or I raise capital for real estate projects. We buy, you know, portfolios of distressed mortgages. We're trying to save America one mortgage at a time, okay? Well, how's that working? Oh, it's great. And then uh, simple questions. Have you ever invested in real estate? You know, if you're at your local real club, of course, the answer is going to be yes. But if you're out talking to your friends and families, maybe they haven't. You know, or if you ever watching, you, know, you ever watch that Fix and Flip Houses? Yeah. Oh, I love that show. Okay. Have you ever done that? No. Hmm. So he says, I love that show, but they've never done it. They probably don't know that, you, that you, they have the opportunity to do it with you for 25 or 50 grand. You can put them into a deal with you. They can itch their internal flip this house. Okay. Now, the big thing, like I say here, don't be afraid to ask for more, okay? If you're looking for 25 grand, say, hey, we're looking for 50, okay? Say it high, because a lot of people, what's the minimum? And I hate the minimum. This goes back to the old stock trading. What's the minimum investment? Well, 
we're really looking for people to invest 50 to 100 grand with us over a couple of deals that we leverages. Okay. Doesn't mean I won't turn somebody away for 25 if I need to get a deal done. Okay. Okay, Bob. Uh, all right, Bob asked a question. Without pulling funds and writing a file at SEC, how do you suggest putting together funds from several investors to take down a pool of, of loans at 150K more? I know I've been over this with you multiple times, Bob. It's the exact same answer. Okay, it's the exact same answer I told you before. You divvy it up. If someone person's got 50 grand there and you got six deals, great. Investor A is funding best, uh, deal one and two. Investor B is funding deal three and four. Investor C is running uh, is funding investor five and six. There's three JV agreements. They're not together. It's three JV agreements to make the deal happen. Okay? I've, I know I've said that multiple times. Okay? You don't pull it together. If you have three friends that want to invest in it, great. Let them go get an LLC together, then you borrow it from one entity. Okay? But when you need to cut people together, it's totally illegal to have one person on one, two, three, four, five individual assets, but they're not cross-collateralized. Okay? Uh, now, the appendix part, <laughs> I didn't realize how goofy that cheerleader looked, is kind of like your rah-rah side, okay? The appendix could be uh, copies of checks. It could be copies of wires, of closed deals. It could be, I think the best thing you do is testimonials of people that are in person, either a picture and then they're on the side or it's written, or maybe it's a copy of, uh, you very easily get testimonials from people on LinkedIn, okay? Copy, paste, or letters. Oh, hey, thank you for helping us. Thank you for helping us save our house. Thank you for modifying. Thank you for helping us out, us out when nobody else would. Okay? Uh, those are things that you can add in your appendix part. Okay? Social media profiles. Hashtag or at, hashtag or at one Scott Carson or hashtag AW Notes. Okay? Put the social media profiles in. Put any awards you receive. Note Educator of the Year or is the social media award winner at the April Mastermind, okay? Or I'm a platinum member of the Note Closures Group. If you don't know what that is, you're going to want to be at the August Mastermind in Austin, Texas, okay? All right. <clears throat> News and media, anytime you've been quoted, uh, very easy and very cheap to put a press release out. Maybe you put a press release out. Oh, we're announcing that our plans for expansion. For 500 bucks, you can get a... a uh, Press release in about a hundred different entities, newspapers, CBS, Market Watch. Okay, very easy. That's like your appendix is like your extracurricular activities. It's the rah rah part. Yay! <laughs> ah, questions. I gotta leave it to Julia. Yay! <laughs> so Wesley asked a good question here. What is the decent foreclosure percentage in the no business? You have to expect to probably be foreclosing on your assets at least 50% of the time. And by foreclosure, I mean deed and loot, cash for keys, that kind of stuff. Is only, uh, consent to judgment is that just a foreclosure basis, okay? <laughs> Not only with this one, did you hear the NFL is getting, considering getting rid of cheerleaders? That will be the day. Jerry Jones will sue the NFL and win. They're not getting rid of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. Here are the Philadelphia Eagles, okay? Come on. Then I can get rid of cheerleaders. Cheer cheerleaders are athletes too. Okay, it's just a different type of physical exertion. Okay, I, I think it's legit. I'm not being. It's tough. Okay, how do I know? Dated plenty of cheerleaders in my life. <laughs> See, I guess they're going wrong. Yay! Uh, so I need green and white pom poms. Yo, Laura, I've got some green and white pom poms somewhere. Okay. I have a, a fluorescent green tutu somewhere too, and angel wings. We need to call ourselves the angel investors. All right, come on. One of the questions is be a little serious here as we're getting off sidetrack. Okay. Can I ask a question about contacting an heir when you're done? <laughs> yes. Yes, you could ask a question, Chris. We're near the end there. Any other questions about the business plan? So before we dive into Chris's question, though, was this helpful? Okay. Now, one of the things that you probably will do, and I think it's a great thing to do, is when you write your business plan is go back and, and check on it every year. You don't have to go on it every 90 days. You know, one of the things you say that one-year goal, then now that one-year goal you set, you want to go back and break it down 90 days. 
doesn't mean go back and rewrite your business plan every month because you'll be spending more time writing your business plan than actually getting things done. So write your business plan, get it out, check on it once a year, go back and adjust your numbers. Because I guarantee most of the people that would go through and did their, uh, built a written a business plan with their, when they were going through the uh, note coaching or note coaching calls, realized they had to go back and adjust their numbers in a much bigger scale. Wayne Snell, I guarantee will tell you that. Jay Tenenbaum, a lot of people had to go back and adjust their numbers. There's people now, right now, I'm doing the mastermind that are adjusting their numbers. Gail Greenberg, Cody Cox, Adam Adams, just to name a few. Okay, Definitely a lot of people adjust your numbers because they have a given path. And the path gets easier and you get better at what you do the more you're in it. Okay? <clears throat> Gail says, your note night in America is always helpful and very timely. Thanks for taking the time for us tonight. Yeah, no problem, Gail. It's, about nine. it's probably late where you're at. Okay, so Chris, ask your question about contacting an heir when you're done. Now, now would be the time to ask that question. Going through, everybody's on Facebook asking anybody questions. Hey, Matt Kelly, good to see you. Hey, Scott Jenkunas. Robert Burrell. See some people out there tonight. Awesome. I sure, if I leave the, the cheerleader photo up, it's going to attract more honey. <laughs> Uh, so Chris asked a question here. So my parents, 80-year-old neighbor, took his life last weekend. Wow. Sorry to hear that. Uh, 60-year-old niece is the sole heir. I have never met her, but I'm interested in the property because my parents need some to take care of them, need someone to take care of them. What's the best way to approach her? Um, honestly, I know it's early, uh, but she's the sole heir. If there was, if, as long as it wasn't uh, left out of uh, probate. I would just send an email. So listen, I know you're in a tough time. Um, you know, obviously after the funeral, but I would I would go ahead and just write a letter to her. You know, if you've got if you get a chance, me and drop a letter. Say, hey, I know you're going through a tough time. I'm I'm sorry for that. And I don't think I think your letter is gonna be a little bit different than somebody who's just doing a, a yellow letter off a of probate leads, which is one of the things that I used to do when I was doing real estate on the traditional real estate side. I would go through the obituaries every weekend and see if they own property, and then I'd mail a yellow letter to that individual who passed away. I would get their heirs to call me back, like, how did you know my father? He passed away. It's like, well, I'm so sorry for you. I know you're going through a rough time. If you're going to get around and ready to sell property, please let me know. I'd love to visit with you whenever you got time. Okay? So, Chris, I would just contact her and say, hey, uh, I know it's like my parents. I'm interested in this property um, because the fact is I, I want you to be close to my parents. It's different than I'm just trying to make a buck. Okay? I would just go ahead and write a letter. Leave a letter on the door, okay? <clears throat> You're welcome, Chris. Be sure I eat at Bubba Gump's. No, Cody, ugh, I hate Bubba Gump's. It's too chain. Um, maybe maybe time, biz plan on LLC anniversary and old day. That's not bad, Roy. Um, one of the things you probably would want to do is I would, especially in your legal side, of your vendors, like if you have lawful associates or your accountants or your attorneys that handle your minutes and stuff like that, that would be a good thing to look back. I'll get with you. Yes, that'd be a good time to go back and review it and keep up with your documents and adjust your business plan. Just got to make time make time to focus on it, okay? Hey, Pam, Alfred, hey, Teresa, first thing, good to see you guys out there tonight. Hey, Roy Johnson, okay? Any other questions or comments from you guys out here um, before we wrap this up? Anybody have any questions about... Thank you, guys. All right. Awesome. Well, I guess there's not any other questions or comments, so we will wrap it up then, guys. Um, hopefully, this is helpful for you all. Uh, uh, no, Gail, just shoot me an email. Shoot me a text message. I'm not taking any more phone calls tonight. My phone's been ringing off the hook since I got in here. Um, sh sure, drop me a text message. Te text message me, and we'll go from there. All right? Text message, we'll go from there. All right, everybody, that is all I've got for you tonight. Hopefully it was valuable. Like I said, I'll, I'll work on trying to get this up on um, weclosenotes.tv here before I head out, so if you guys can want to catch the replay, okay? Do I have a Sam Please business plan? I don't understand what you're asking. A sample business plan? No. Al Allison, you can go out and Google and do a sample business plan. I I'm not going to provide one for you, okay? There's a tool called Google. All right, go out and Google it. There's plenty of business plans floating around out there. And, and trust me, 
don't get so tied up into I've seen business plans are a lot more advanced than when I went through with you guys. They're like 20 different sections. And it was, that's great, but it's overkill. So your business model, your business plan is to be somewhere between the full business plan and then the, um, the, 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 um, the simple one. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. But just Google it. You'll find plenty of business plans out there. All right. All right, everybody. Well, hey, that wraps up for tonight. We will not have a Note Night in America next Monday night. Uh, we will the fall on Monday on the 5th, um, but we will not have one next Monday night. We are going to enjoy our R&R &R in Hawaii. The next Monday is the 7th? No, it's the 5th. It's the 5th because it's, no, it's Monday, Mondays. It's the 7th? Okay, we'll have one on the 7th then. I stand corrected. Look at that. How easy this means to say it's long. Just a calendar, see? Just a simple calendar mix up all the time. Okay. Anything scheduled for Wednesday? No, Wayne. There's no, I'm in I'm on vacation, buddy. You can live without me a week for Wednesday. Okay. See y'all at the top, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody.